what it says. Okay? And having worked not in, um, I'm trying to tie my shoelace and talk at the same time. Having worked in the polymer industry, I can tell you that this is the kind of thing that you sell, you sell products based on. Somebody has certain specifications and you have to satisfy them. It, for polymers, have we been through this before? We asked you, do you guys know what a polymer is? And you all go, yes, it's okay. All right. Um, so for a polymer, you're usually interested in certain characteristics of the polymer, like what the molecular weight is, right? So a polymer is a long chain. And you can't make all the chains to be exactly the same length. So there's actually a distribution of chain lengths. And they have certain measures of that, kind of like the mean and the variance, if you want. And when you sell it to a customer, they have specifications on those, those measures. Because if you want to make something from the polyethylene you're getting, you have to have certain characteristics. Okay? And so you have to guarantee them with some certainty, or some uncertainty, if you will, that you're going to be able to, to um, give them what they want. So, if I was buying these thin films and I was worried about having more than two defects, I wouldn't worry about it much. Because you see, the idea is once I get these thin films, I'm not going to test them. I'm just going to use them. <laughs> and what I'm going to find is sometimes they're not going to work because the films are defective, but it's not going to be frequently. It's going to be infrequently. And I have, to ex I have to assume some risk, you see. I can't ask the question, well, I could. What's the probability you'll make 100 films that'll never be defective? That is true, but it's not usually a very reasonable measure. It's like, you can't ask a manufacturer to be perfect, usually. All right, so that's the binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the normal distribution, which is an example of a continuous probability distribution. So we know a continuous distribution. We have a random variable x can assume infinitely many real values. That means like temperature, pressure, flow, whatever real variable you're interested in. We have two functions, the probability distribution function, the cumulative distribution function. <coughs> They're related to each other like this. So if I give you the probability function, you can derive the cumulative distribution function by performing this integration, assuming you can integrate this. We did an example of this last time when I gave you a simple F here. Conversely, if I were to give you the cumulative distribution function, you can recover the probability function by taking the derivative of the cumulative. So they're related by derivative and integral, okay? If you want to know the probability that the random variable, if I give you this function f here, the cumulative distribution function, you want to know the probability that the random variable x that it describes will be between a and b. You evaluate the cumulative function at b, subtract off the value at a. If that's equivalent to taking the probability function and integrating it between A and B, same thing. I mean, you either integrate it here or you integrate it here. You, you did integrate it at some point. And by definition, this has to be true. Otherwise, F's not a legitimate probability function, right? If I integrate this function from minus infinity to infinity, it has to be 1. <coughs> Area under the curve has to be 1 for it to be legitimate. All right. So here's something you know and love. Well, you kind of know and you'll learn to love is more accurate. Um, so when we talk about uh, probability distribution functions, we're going to use actually three of them. Um, this is the main one we use. We also use uh, the t distribution, which you may have seen before, the t test. You may have heard something called the t test. We'll also use something called the chi-squared distribution. But this is the main distribution we'll use, the normal distribution. It's also sometimes I'll call it the Gaussian distribution. I shall never call it the bell-shaped curve, but some people enjoy calling it that. Especially when they talk about grades, right? Everyone wants bell-shaped curves. Um, anyway. So here is the probability density function for the normal distribution. It's kind of complex looking. So what does it involve? Well, it involves something called... Me so when you have a distribution function, you have something called parameters of the distribution. This distribution function has two parameters. It has something called mu and has something called sigma. Right, and if I give you mu and sigma, then in principle, you can plug any value of x in here you want and calculate the f. So, and this, this mu and sigma are exactly what you might expect them to be. Mu is the mean and sigma is the standard deviation, okay? So that what's one thing unique about the normal distribution is it's completely characterized by its mean and distribution. Nothing, there is no other information. Remember when I talked about moments and I said you could talk about 
the third moment of a distribution, like how asymmetric it is, none of those other measures or moments of a distribution mean anything for the normal distribution because it's completely characterized by its mean and its standard deviation. There's nothing else. Okay? <coughs> and if you were to perform this integration, and I don't actually don't know if this is integrable. I guess it is. I don't know. But if you were to integrate it, you would from minus infinity to infinity, you'd find it's equal to one like it should be. This is what it looks like, and this should look pretty familiar to you. So what I'm doing here is plotting this value f here. I'm picking mu to be zero, zero mean. That's why they're all centered about zero. And then I'm showing you what it looks like for different values of sigma. If sigma is small, then it, has a, it always has a peak at zero because that's the mean. But if mu, uh, sigma is small, then it doesn't have much variation about the mean. It has small standard deviation, or we call it small va variance. And as sigma gets large, you see a much wider spread. Okay? So the implication here is that if you were to t sample from this distribution with sigma equal 0.25, it would be pretty likely you'd get something near the mean and almost guaranteed it'd be between minus 1 and 1, right? There's some probability that this will be 1. You just can't see it. It'd be very unlikely. Conversely, if sigma's all the way to 1, you can see that you can get a lot of, it's pretty probable you could get a wide range of values. So the idea when you, you have data, usually, is that you'd like to have, you calculate the mean, but usually you'd like the sigma to be fairly small, okay? Now when we use this, usually we do not know mu and sigma, right? So if somebody says, I collected data from this experiment in Chemical Engineering 401 lab, you don't know what the mean and the variance are for that data set. You can calculate from the samples, that's an estimate, but you don't, you don't usually know the true mean and variance, right? But if you did, you'd know the distribution function and it would look like that. All right, so that's the distribution function, little f of x. This is the cumulative distribution function, big F of x. It just, it, you haven't accomplished much here. <laughs> All you did was take this function here, okay? Where'd it go? Here. And by definition of the cumulative distribution function, you integrated this from minus infinity to some value x. To get the cumulative distribution function, if you do, you get that. I say it's not a great achievement because you haven't you haven't performed the integration, probably because you can't integrate it easily, not at analytically, right? So the idea is, if you, as I'll explain in a minute, a plot of this, or more accurately, this is in not a plot. <coughs> values are in the book, in table. I think it's A8. Maybe it's A7N A8, as I'll explain in a moment. So because you can't integrate this, it's, it's presented in tabular form in the book. Okay, now, so let's say you had this, this will be a common problem. I'll give you a mu and a sigma, and you'll want to know what the value of this function is for a particular value x, right? I want to know, so what does that mean? If, if you calculate this probability x here, you're asking yourself, what's the probability the random variable big X will be X or less, right? That's what you use the cumulative distribution function for. So it'll be very common that in problems we solve, we'll want to evaluate this function for different values of X to calculate probabilities, cumulative probabilities. All right, so this, you see, you can't present this equation in a table because it has mu and sigma. And what are you going to do, present a table for every possible combination of mu and sigma? That's not going to work out for you. So what is plotted is something called the standardized distribution, okay? It's this function here where mu equals zero and sigma squared equals one, or sigma equals one, same thing. So in other words, the tables that you're presented in the book, or anywhere else for that matter, are for this cumulative distribution function assuming the mu is zero and the sigma is one. So that way, right, you can have a single table. Um, so if your problem is not this way, you have to use the numbers and modify them, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay. So it's actually plotted in the book, or put in tabular form, is this function here. It's the same as this, except the mu is zero and the sigma is equal to one. So in other words, if you were to put they changed it a little bit. They changed the dummy variable of integration here. Um, okay, you see what they've done here is they've changed the independent variable of the function from x to z. They've changed the integration variable from v to u. And by definition, um, see this is, now I'm going to write and I've got to turn this back on. So 
So the z variable here that is being used is defined. You can see its definition. You take your value x, you subtract off the mu, you divide by sigma, and that's the definition of z, okay? So you understand in your, in your problem, you have variable x, it's like temperature or whatever. You have a certain mean and vari uh, this is standard deviation. What you have to do is, you, which I'll explain more in a minute, you have to compute z. So that means take your value, subtract off the mean, divide by the standard deviation. To use the table, you have to do this. Okay? So this is the function that's actually plotted in the table or put in tabular form. And it looks something like this. Okay, so this is what this function, like what is that, psi? Is that what that thing's called? Psi of z, okay, um, looks like. Um, plot, so this is, um, why did they call this? <laughs> okay, I think they've got a few inconsistencies here. Because they're saying it's a plot of this, but you see it up here, it's actually called phi of x. So, what they're really plotting here is phi of z versus z. They're plotting this function here, okay? So this is the cumulative distribution function, and this assumes, again, a mean of zero and a variance of one. So if you wanted to ask yourself, you could use this function, um, let's just say for the moment, you actually have a mean of zero and a variance of one, which you nor no normally will, but, and you ask yourself, what's the probability my random variable x will be one or less? You come up here, you find that, what is like, I don't know, 0.9 almost, close, I can't see, 0.85. So that means if, if, you, if this was actually the case that you had, there'd be an 85% probability that the random variable would be one or less, okay? So the key point here, which we'll see in a couple of examples, um, is that if you wanna use this function, you have to convert your problem into something that uses what's in the table. And the key thing is that definition I wrote on the board here. Okay, and I'll show you how to use it in a moment. To make any sense, um, as we start to use the book and the, there's a piece of gum if anybody wants one, all right? Um, as we start to use the tables in the book, it would be helpful if you looked at the table at some point, right? Because I'm not gonna bring the book. And it's not, it's not in the online stuff. You know, I steal this stuff from the online resource for the instructor. They don't have the tables online. And I'm not gonna hold up the book because well, would be, would be outrageous, all right? So it would be helpful if you look at these tables so that you know what I'm talking about when I say I, g I get a value, I have a value z and I pull out a value psi for that so you understand what I'm talking about, okay? All right. So here it starts to give an example of how you use this. So let's say you want to know this. You, you want to know what's the probability that the random variable will be between b and a. <coughs> and usually, you understand that, um, well, let's just, never mind. You want to know this. What's the probability of the random variable between b and a? So you take the cumulative function, evaluate at b, subtract off the cumulative function, evaluate at a. Okay. But generally speaking, you'll have a distribution, a normal distribution of arbitrary mean and arbitrary variance. So in order to use the table, you have to compute this, these quantities, just using this expression I put right here. So this is not what the table gives you. The table gives you this. So you take your value b, subtract off the mean, divided by sigma, and then you look up that value, okay? And you do the same thing with a, and you subtract those two. So you just, it's not that complex. It's just a variable transformation. Every time you have a normal distribution with a certain mean and a certain variance, you have to normalize your infer the, the data like this to use the table. That's it. Okay. All right, so we can start talking about things people often use in statistical analysis of processes, for example, called sigma limits. Okay. So if you had, um, you're measuring something like uh, composition, so something like that, and you want to know what's the probability that my measurement of the composition will be within one standard deviation of the mean. That's what this is asking. So this is your random variable. What's the probability it'll be between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma? It's called one standard deviation away from the mean, about 68%. So it's, it's likely, but it's not unlikely it won't be, right? It's still 32% left. What's the probability be between two sigma? It's called the two sigma limit. So it'll be either less than mu by two sigma or greater than mu by two sigma. That's 95.5%. 
So it's not that likely something will be greater than that. Three sigma, 99.7%, okay? And that's shown in these plots here. So this one is for the one sigma limit, and this is for two. So when you're saying you're within one sigma, that's the area here, and then you have these other two things that's greater than that or less than that constitute the other 32%. And then for the um, two sigma limit, 95.5% uh, and the other 4.5% is down there and up there. So let's put it this way. Let's say for you, you had a process and that um, you had, you knew the mu and you knew the sigma and you collected a piece of data that was outside this range here, it's not very likely, okay? So you understand, if you're running a process, there's two types of errors. One is random error. That's statistics. That's all we're talking about, random errors. When random errors become very unlikely, you begin to wonder if that error is really random, <laughs> okay? So if I were to run a process and all of a sudden I got a measurement that was outside this range, I would conclude that's really unlikely. I bet something else is happening than random error. You get what I'm saying? I better go look at my process to see if something's happening because this is not likely. It's not impossible. You could be wrong. It could be random error. But that's, this is, we don't really have time to talk about it, unfortunately, in the course, but there's something called statistical process control that's often used um, in industry, and they use these kind of concepts, okay? So you, you start to look at when are samples way away from the mean that you expect. And if they're way away from the mean, um, they're usually not random, and therefore that means you should go look at the process and see what's going on. Gives you like a way of monitoring if things are working. All right? You understand there's no way to stop random error. It's hopeless. <laughs> you just got to give up, okay? But what you want to do is to try to distinguish random error from non-random error, because non-random error is something you might be able to fix. Okay, so here's how you use these tables. So if you look in the book, there'll be two tables. They're in the back of the book. So they're appendix A7 and A8. So what um, A7 gives you is um, I give you the X, or more accurately, I should say this. So the table 7, right, we're talking about this function. Hopefully I can write it correctly. Okay. So table 7, I give you Z and I want you to give me the value, the probability for that value z. It's, it's the cumulative distribution function, right, with zero mean and variance one. I give you, I'm, I have z, I want the probability. That's table A7. Okay, the other, and that's the cumulative distribution function. The other one is, I have the probability, I want you to give me back the z that has that probability. That's called the inverse cumulative distribution function. That's table A8, okay? Usually we're interested in I have Z, want probability, but sometimes you have probability, you want Z, okay? All right. And to use the table, you have two, two things in mind. One, I've beaten into your skull pretty good so far. That's, you have to compute Z. So if you want to use the table, the ta I, don't, I don't remember exactly what notation the table looks like, but it, it does something like this. You get the idea? It gives you a z and a phi of z corresponding to that. All right. So first thing is you have, to, you have to compute the z, not the x that you might originally get. You compute it like this. Take your value, subtract off the mean, scale by the standard deviation. That takes your variable that has arbitrary mean and arbitrary variance and creates a new variable called z, and that variable z has mean zero and variance one, and that you can use the table, okay? The other thing is sometimes you'll find that the, 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 phi you, the z you calculate is negative, and there's no entries in the table for negative z, right? So you can use this definition here. So if you end up wanting to calculate like phi of minus two, you'll see there's no minus twos in the table, but this is a definition. You can, you can compute phi of positive two and then subtract that from one and that's that answer. So you, it doesn't, you can, z being negative is fine. All right. <coughs> All right, let's try to use this. This is one I found a lot of mistakes in last night, so I'm hoping I fixed them. Let's see. Okay, so 
you make polymer. Okay, so this is uh, my favorite industry because I worked in it with ExxonMobil. It was a lot of fun because um, I was a consultant. That's the ideal job, by the way. That's one where you get paid a lot of money for doing almost nothing and have no responsibility. So um, <laughs> I recommend that mode of operation if you can get it. All right, so you make polymer, right? And these guys make lots of polymer. They might make you know, 50,000 pounds a day of polyethylene or polypropylene or something like that. So how do you know it's good? It's very hard to measure. Some things are easy to measure online, right? Like if someone has said, what's the flow rate? You'd like just put a flow meter and measure it or temperature. But how do you me measure the molecular weight distribution of a polymer? You really can't online easily. There's ways. But so what do you do? You take, sa you take samples and bring them to the laboratory. And then every once in a while, they give you back what's happening. Okay? Let's say these, we're making this polymer and they collected 10 samples. Okay, these 10 samples. You understand the real molecular weight is like 1.2 times 10 to the minus fifth. Sorry, 10 to the plus fifth. They're big chains, they have a high molecular weight. I just didn't want to write 10 to the minus fifth. T 10 to the, ah, I'll slap myself occasionally. All right, I didn't want to write 1.2 times 10 to the minus fifth, so I'm just telling you I scaled all these. All right? All right. So I want to know the following. <coughs> So you look at these samples, right? And we're assuming this variability is random. If it's not random, then we shouldn't be using the statistics we're using. But I want to know, or I want to compute the probability that a given sample will have molecular weight less than or equal to this. And what I'm assuming here is I don't know the true mean invariance. Okay. So let's say you want to use this, the normal distribution. You want to ask this question. I want to know, so I have these samples and I want to know the probability the molecular weight will be less than or equal to this. I can tell you it's, it's not that unlikely, right? Because I can already three, see three samples that are less, so I, it could occur, clearly. And I want to compute the probability. Now, I don't know the true mean and the true variance because no one's give, given them to me. So how do I get the, tr the mean and the variance? I calculate them from the samples. So in other words, if you have the true mean and variance, you would use them. But you almost never do, <laughs> okay? So what you do is get your best estimate is to calculate them from the samples, right? What else are you going to do? There's no other option. So what I'm saying here is I don't know the true mean, but my best approximation is the mean calculated from the samples. And I don't know the true variance, but my best estimate is the variance calculated from the samples. Okay. Now, sometimes people might have a pretty good idea what this number is because they've calculated, they've collected data over years and they've averaged a lot of data and they might have a real good idea what they think the mean is. But no one gives you the normal distribution function for the polymer molecular weight. It, you know, you just don't, it's just not possible. So you calculate your best guess based on the samples available. And as we've talked about before, these guesses are liable to be increasingly good as you get a lot of samples. And I tried to prove to you, I think last lecture, that you probably can get a decent estimate of the mean from 10 samples. I would be pretty suspicious of the variance from 10 samples because to analyze variability, you usually need lots of samples. But this is the best we can do. Okay. So I want to ask this question. What's the probability of this random variable would be less than 1? This is a typo. There's, for <laughs> there's a 10 to the plus fifth. Right? It's a molecular, it's big, molecular weight, typo, plus fifth. Okay. Um, what's the probability the molecular weight will have molecular weight less than one times 10 to the fifth? So what I need to do is calculate the cumulative distribution function at one, right? Because that tells me the probability it'll be one or less. That's why I use the cumulative distribution function. Okay, but I want to use the table. And to use the table, I have to normalize my variable like this. I have to subtract off the mean, and I have to divide by the standard deviation. I've calculated the variance. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. That's why I'm taking the square root to get s instead of s squared. And unless I made a mistake, um, you calculate this quantity, you get this number. Okay, that number is negative. Therefore, it's not in the table, but you can use this identity here. So phi of this number is 1 minus phi of that number being positive. And that's in the table. If you look it up, it's that number right there. And to see that, you have to go look at the table. And so you'll see it's, it's 32%. So it's pretty, based on the samples I have available, which aren't a lot, it's, it's about a one-third chance it'll be less than that. 
So it's, it's not like unlikely. So if your goal was to make sure the molecular weight was higher than one, you're probably pretty unhappy because there's like a 33% chance it won't be. All right. All right, here's another um, example. So now you're running a bioreactor. You guys know what a bioreactor is? This is a, this is a, a, ke a chemical reactor, if you will, but you're growing cells and cells make things. These cells could be microbial cells or they could be mammalian cells or insect cells or all plant cells, all kinds of weird things. But one of the key things about growing cells in a bioreactor is you have to maintain the bioreactor at a certain temperature where the cells like to grow, okay? So let's say our goal is to maintain the temperature of some bioreactor at 30 degrees and someone's told us that there's a standard deviation of uh, about one degree. So in other words, someone's collected data over a long time and they've calculated the mean is 30 degrees and there's a standard deviation of about one degree. And then you would like, let's say, the temperature to be within plus or minus 0.5 degrees of 30, like normally between 30.5 and 29.5. And you want to know how often is that going to be the case. You already know you're in trouble, right? Because the standard deviation is larger than that number, but you calculate it anyway. So you're interested, what's the probability that it'll be between these two limits? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the probability that it's 30.5 or less, that's this, and I'm going to calculate the probability it's 29.5 or less, and then I'm going to subtract the two to get the probability of it being between, okay? So same thing here, if you want to know the probability of being 29.5 or less, you have to normalize, so I subtract off the mean, that, I normalize by the standard deviation, which is that, I get that number, I use this relationship, look it up, it's that number, okay? Do the same thing for 30. I want to know when it's 30.5 or less. Subtra to do that, to use the table, I've got to subtract off the mean, divide by the standard deviation. You get this number. You can look that up directly in the table. It'll be that, okay? You want to know the probability of being between those two limits. You subtract that, that one from that one, and you get that. So in other words, if I'm running this reactor, and this is true, only about 38% of the time is it actually in the range I want. The rest of the time, it's, it's greater than half a degree away, okay? Which is not surprising given the standard deviation I specified. All right, that's it. That's it, people. Okay. I thought I had more, but that's okay. Um, so I will see you tomorrow. We'll do MATLAB.